Hi all, this lecture is about aquaculture. So I'd like to introduce this aquaculture unit with a look into how people in the past viewed the future. People in the past viewed the future in a very optimistic, imaginative way. They saw technology as a solution to many, if not all, of our problems and they viewed the ocean as a frontier that would be explored and exploited in wonderful and exciting ways with submarines and underwater houses and fish farms in the water. And some of these things have not come to pass. We're not living under the ocean, for example. Uh, but many of these past visions of the future have become more common, and aquaculture is one of them, uh, farming the sea. Um, an another funny vision of the future from the past was this Sea City 2000. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when we viewed the year 2000 as something very futuristic, and the number just had sort of an awesome quality uh, to zero zero the, the third millennium. So um, it's a little ironic now that we're 22, 20 years into this new millennium and it does, the year 2000 now seems kind of old-fashioned, but uh, at, at, in the 80s and before we thought the year 2000 would really be a futuristic time where we would be living in space colonies and under the sea and in, in sea cities like this. And, and so we can kind of laugh at this, but you know, there are some modern things now, such as aquaculture and other ocean technologies that are not so far off of this futuristic vision. For example, the uh, huge cities that are being built on artificial islands in um, Dubai and places like that. So uh, this, some of these things are look pretty wild now and others are not so far from the truth. All right, so let's bring it back to aquaculture, this uh, thing that we forecast in the past and now ha which has actually come to pass. And let's contrast aquaculture with capture fisheries, which when we just say fisheries, we're talking about capture fisheries. So sometimes students will confuse aquaculture and fisheries. Um, fisheries, if I say that, I just mean catching and harvesting fish from the wild, whereas aquaculture means farming fish. Or it actually doesn't have to be fish per se, it could be any marine organisms that you're farming. So it could be shellfish or even seaweed uh, would be considered aquaculture if you're farming them, and fisheries if you're harvesting them from the wild. Okay, so in aquaculture, as opposed to capture fisheries, we're giving nature a helping hand. We're doing some kind of intervention to help grow and farm the organisms that we're harvesting rather than just letting nature do all the work and scooping up her products. So aquaculture is a broad term that means uh, harvesting organisms from either freshwater or saltwater. And there's a more specific term, mariculture, that means um, farming organisms from saltwater specifically. So all mariculture is aquaculture, but not all aquaculture is mariculture. Only saltwater aquaculture is mariculture. Aquaculture and mariculture, or aquaculture, which includes mariculture, has been expanding exponentially since the mid 20th century. And this contrasts strongly with capture fisheries, which plateaued in about 1990 when we reached more or less the maximum amount of wild harvests that the ocean could provide for us. And because the demand for seafood was still increasing, we turned to aquaculture to produce more seafood than the ocean could produce for us to harvest by capture fisheries alone. So we've now surpassed the total amount of fish production of, the, of nature in our fish farming through aquaculture. And this is just some statistics on the relative amounts of current capture fisheries, uh, about 90 million tons. And there was a period where capture fisheries were increasing rapidly from the 50s to the 90s, but like I said, we hit that plateau where we more or less ran out of fish in the ocean, and that's why that hasn't been increasing since. 
whereas aquaculture has been really, really expanding. Um, and most of that expansion has been in the freshwater environment. So where aquaculture is growing most rapidly is in freshwater ponds and lakes and rivers, whereas uh, fisheries, wild fisheries, are still the most common way of uh, getting saltwater seafood. So aquaculture has some big advantages over capture fisheries. One is that it's more dependable and potentially more sustainable. So nature is variable. Uh, in particular, when we studied the fisheries, we learned about variable recruitment, how differences from year to year in the success of spawning and survival of the young fish means that fish populations go through these boom and bust cycles that makes it hard to base a steady economic harvest on. Also, fish in the wild are mixed together, all the different species of the ocean uh, in some of the same places and catching what you want, you end up catching a lot of inadvertent bycatch at the same time and that's wasteful and uneconomical. Also, it's the ocean is a dangerous place and when you're out there fishing in the ocean, your boat can sink in a storm, uh, you can have a mechanical breakdown, there's all kind of terrible things that can happen when you're out on the high seas. And there's some types of environmental damage inflicted by fisheries, like trawling, which destroys the bottom, and fishing gear that can break loose and ensnare whales and sea turtles and things like that. So um, with aquaculture, we're less likely to inflict that kind of environmental damage. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't some environmental problems with aquaculture as well, and we'll talk about those more later. Uh, another thing to think about in the aquaculture versus capture fisheries contrast is the cost-benefit balance of each. So um, the great appeal of capture fisheries is that you don't do any work to raise the organisms. You just go out there and snatch them from nature. So you have to spend some money to get your boat out there and scoop your net, but you didn't really have to make any investment in rearing the fish. So with aquaculture, you definitely have to invest some more money up front to, to raise those organisms that you're harvesting from young to adults. And, and that can cost more money, but you get a consistent large harvest, and so you may get more of a payoff as well. And you won't have things like the gas costs or maintenance costs for your boats. Um, and from an ecological sustainability standpoint, there's definitely some pros and cons to aquaculture versus capture fisheries. And I'm going to sort of table that discussion until we get further into the lecture. I just want to introduce that uh, aquaculture is not inherently sustainable, and that's something that we need to think about a little bit. So not all aquaculture is the same, and a way to understand the differences or the spectrum of different kinds of aquaculture is to make an analogy to agriculture on land. And agriculture on land we can classify as intensive agriculture or extensive agriculture. So intensive agriculture is where you put a lot of work into growing the organisms. You usually have them reared under controlled conditions where you supply all of their food and um, remove their waste and you medicate them and you breed them intentionally and all kinds of uh, detailed animal husbandry things that you uh, put into raising the organisms and in return you get like a really large yield of your organisms from a relatively small area. Uh, it's just an intensive effort for a large yield. Whereas extensive agriculture is where you let nature do most of the work, so your animals may run free, at least for part of their life cycle, and then you just have to sort of round them up and harvest them uh, when it's, it's time to kill and use them. So extensive agriculture is like ranching, where the animals are sort of roaming the wilds and eating wild food for much of their life, whereas intensive agriculture is like farming or where you're holding things in a feedlot or a, a stable or a pen and um, doing it under more controlled conditions. So with aquaculture, intensive aquaculture would be like farming. So you're feeding and rearing the species for its entire life cycle. Uh, 
the fish is born in captivity and it dies in captivity and it's in captivity its whole life being fed deliberately and all that kind of stuff whereas extensive aquaculture you're enhancing the population uh, that you're harvesting in a less direct way so you're making usually not like totally fencing in and controlling the, the population. Um, you're just doing something to enhance the stock, either you're raising young in a hatchery and releasing them into the wild, hoping to catch them later, or creating some kind of habitat in the environment that you're going to then visit again to harvest organisms from it, or doing any number of a more indirect uh, type of intervention to enhance the stock. So extensive aquaculture is easiest with species that are low on the food chain and have low mobility. So doing something like laying down oyster shell for oyster settlement and then going out and harvesting the oysters that settle on that shell, that's uh, a type of extensive agriculture, uh, aquaculture. Uh, you can also stock fish in rice paddies and there will be naturally occurring insects and algae and um, plankton in the rice paddy water for those fish to eat and so you don't have to feed them anything extra but you can go and harvest the fish when you harvest the rice so um, those are sort of low maintenance kinds of aquaculture you if you are looking for sort of like a easy reminder of what extensive aquaculture is like it's the low maintenance aquaculture All right, so the earliest aquaculture that we know of is something that originated um, three to 4,000 years ago in China. And we think that the earliest aquaculture sort of developed gradually from a type of fish that was being caught in the wild, but then bit by bit, we started to sort of manage the wild harvest of the, that fish more and more closely uh, and sort of keep them in captivity for part of their life cycle and then eventually learned how to breed them in captivity in artificial ponds or um, dammed off parts of streams and, and things like that. And so we gradually developed uh, aquaculture for this species, Cyprinus, or Cyprinus carpio, the common carp, which is uh, the same species as the goldfish and the koi. So the common carp is a really popular game fish and food fish in almost every part of the world except the United States. For some reason here, we consider it sort of like a trash fish or a junk fish, maybe because it's an invasive species here. And yet in other parts of the world, they view it as a trophy catch. And there are magazines in the supermarkets uh, that are kind of like the magazines that we have in our United States supermarkets that have bass on the cover, but there um, they have carp on the cover. All right, so carp aquaculture was going great for a thousand years or so in China until there was an emperor in China whose name was Li, which actually it means carp. Um, in Chinese, and Li didn't like the fact that his name was associated with this sort of common agriculture species. It would sort of be like if you were named President Cow or something. And, and so he forbid people from uh, having aquaculture of carp, Li, because he didn't want to sort of bring his name down and have it be associated with this ugly bottom feeding fish. Uh, people got around that though by learning to domesticate five other species of carp other than the common carp and that actually helped to advance aquaculture because it turned out that these five new species of carp or well I mean the species have been around in the wild forever they weren't like newly bred um, but they uh, were newly domesticated and it turns out that they worked really well for aquaculture because the things that they ate were complementary to each other. So uh, I'll, I'll show pictures of them on the next page. All right, so here's the mud carp, the big head carp, and the silver carp. The big head carp and the silver carp eat zooplankton. Uh, the grass carp eats aquatic vegetation. Uh, the black carp eats uh, aquatic invertebrates. And the mud carp is sort of a 
think it's a mixture of invertebrates and, and detritus. And all these things sort of feed on different parts of food sources in the aquatic environment. So if you grow them in the same environment, you can get a total yield of fish that's greater than if you were breeding any one species by itself. And that's a good example of the values of polyculture. Polyculture is where you have multiple species uh, growing together in the same environment, either naturally occurring there or because you deliberately stocked multiple species in the same environment. And polyculture uh, can have some big benefits for yields as well as for the environment. All right, so let's look at some of the differences between aquaculture in the water and animal agriculture on land. Um, they're similar in some ways that we've already discussed, but they have some differences as well. And I'd like to highlight the way they differ in terms of the number of species, the trophic level of the species, time since domestication, and the variety of settings or environments that we're doing that uh, farming activity in. So for um, aquaculture, there are potentially a lot of species that we would want to do aquaculture with because there are a lot of species that we harvest from the wild oceans. The number of types of fish and shellfish that you can find in a fish market is huge, for example. And so there's already kind of like a market of people who want to eat a certain kind of fish. And there's sort of like a desire to have a more sustainable source potentially of that particular species of uh, fish or uh, other ocean organism. And so we're trying to learn how to raise a whole bunch of different times, types of uh, species that we're used to catching from the wild. And that really contrasts strongly with terrestrial animal farming where there's not that many different species that um, uh, we farm on land. It's pretty much chicken, cow, pig, sheep, and goat. And there's a few others that are you know regionally important, but these five species are the dominant types of animals that we farm on land and so we know those few species really really well and it, that's a big contrast with uh, aquaculture where there's a whole bunch of different species that all have different needs and we're, we're not like experts yet in any one of those species. Uh, another difference is the trophic level of the species. So the species that we have gotten used to sort of catching from the wild from the ocean are predominantly predators like um, large predatory fish, for example, or, or omnivores, um, whereas the chicken, cow, pig, sheep, and goat are all plant eaters on land. And so there's quite a difference in the demands of farming an herbivore, which you can feed plants, and a predator, which you have to find some kind of meat source to farm it. And that could be quite difficult. And so this trophic level of species is a big uh, consideration in aquaculture that we have to deal with. Uh, another thing that's interesting is the time since domestication. So the chicken, cow, pig, sheep, and goat have been domesticated for thousands of years and so we have lots of experience farming them. We know every detail of their life cycles, how to breed them, and um, also we've selectively bred them to be really good for aquaculture to produce a lot of meat and milk and wool and the other products that we get from those animals. Um, whereas with the aquaculture, we're new to this, uh, relatively new for most of the species with the exception of the carp. Um, they, we've only just recently started doing aquaculture with them and so they're not that different from their wild forms and we still have a lot of challenges in figuring out the best ways to raise them. Uh, another one of the challenges with aquaculture is that you know we harvest fish and shellfish from the wild from lots and lots of different ecosystems from coral reefs to mangrove swamps to um, deep continental shelf habitats to the open ocean and um, that means there's a lot of different kinds of environments and organism needs that we have to try to sort of recreate in the aquaculture setting Whereas with the chicken, cow, pig, sheep, and goat, there's kind of like a standard barnyard layout. Uh, and it's not like you have to um, consider all these environmental needs of the those domestic species on land in the same way that you do for the ocean ones. All right. And so this underlying point that I have here in yellow 
is Animal Husbandry 101. Animal Husbandry means like rearing and, and raising animals. So to be able to raise animals and have multiple generations of that animal in captivity, you need to know the specific life history details of that species. So you need to know what foods it needs at different life stages, what kind of uh, temperature conditions it needs, what kind of uh, um, water chemistry and all these other uh, needs which may change as the organism goes through its different life stages it may have a very specific need in terms of uh, what kind of conditions it needs to breed or spawn uh, and because of those complex life histories and needs of marine organisms there's some marine organisms that are really just not very amenable to aqua aquaculture. They're just really hard to breed in captivity and it may not be economically worth it to do so. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that aquaculture is an inclusive term that means anything grown in either fresh or salt water, um, but mariculture is specifically for salt water. And there's an interesting general trend in the types of species that we have in freshwater aquaculture versus mariculture. So in freshwater aquaculture, uh, we tend to have species that are at a low trophic level, that are low on the food chain, that eat plants or detritus. And the blue tilapia um, here is an example of one of those herbivorous slash omnivorous freshwater fish that's easy to grow a lot of on a cheap food source and it can produce a lot of protein cheaply. Whereas at the opposite end of the spectrum, this mariculture species, the bluefin tuna, is a very large top predator fish and needs to eat vast quantities of other fish in order to get to be the size that it is. Uh, so it's, it's really kind of impractical and yet it's so economically valuable as a food product that even though it's really inefficient trophically to feed it because you have to catch the fish to feed it, um, it can still be worth it in some situations. All right, uh, so not all aquaculture is fish farming. We actually grow some plants or seaweeds in the ocean for harvest, and one of the most common types is nori. That's the Japanese name for this red algae in the genus Porphyra. And that red algae is dried and used to wrap sushi rolls and in other uh, Japanese cuisine. And it's funny because even though it's a red alga and looks red in the wild, it turns green when it's dried. And so you wouldn't know that it was a red alga. There's other types of seaweed that are also harvested, not necessarily for direct human consumption, but because chemicals that are useful in uh, food processing or other um, applications can be extracted from those seaweeds. So gooey substances with useful properties that can be extracted from seaweeds include agar and carrageenan. Um, and so they're used in a lot of different things that are not food, as well as used in food. For Ice cream, for example, has um, uh, some of these compounds in it. All right, so I'm kind of going back to these uh, two examples, the tilapia from freshwater and the bluefin tuna from saltwater, as sort of emblematic species to emphasize this theme here of quality versus quantity. So in aquaculture worldwide, carnivorous species are only 10% by weight. That means that most aquaculture is of herbivorous or omnivorous species like the tilapia. 90% is these kind of, you know, um, cheap uh, bottom feeding, plant feeding fishes, 90% by weight. But for, um, by value, carnivores, even though they're 10%, um, they are 40% of the money. So that means that they're exceptionally valuable monetarily, even though you're not getting a large yield from them like you are with the herbivorous, omnivorous fish. Um, okay, so freshwater aquaculture of species like the tilapia dominates by quantity. Like I said, 90% by weight is these herbivorous fish, which are predominantly freshwater fish. Uh, and that makes it, because it's a really efficient way to make this large mass of meat, it's a practical source of protein for starving people of the world. 
Uh, marine aquaculture is really different. Um, although it's economically valuable, it's not really producing a large quantity. And so it's more of what we would call a quality food. It's, it's a highly sought after gourmet food for wealthy first world people, um, even though it's not really a, a practical means of feeding the world. So besides um, seaweeds as products uh, and fish as food, there's another type of aquaculture, and that's aquaculture of ornamental species like fish tank fish. And that's actually potentially really, really valuable because um, fish that we catch for fish tanks and corals and anemones that we use in fish tanks and, and other uh, reef organisms that are used in, in fish tanks the harvesting of them can really take a toll on reef environments of the world, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. And if we could have alternative ways to grow those species in captivity, we could reduce the pressure on the wild stocks of those fish. And so there's a program at Florida Atlantic University, um, FAU, uh, in Florida here, that is all about designing aquaculture ways to grow popular aquarium fishes like the clownfish here. So the clownfish is a type of damselfish that's found in the Indo-Pacific and actually doesn't live in Florida, um, at least not in the wild. But um, here in Florida, we're learning to do aquaculture of this fish. And if you buy this special type of license plate, um, your money will go to Florida Atlantic University's um, aquaculture program where they're learning how to raise more types of uh, ornamental fish and invertebrates in captivity. Uh, if, if you're an aquarist yourself and you'd like to find graduate school opportunities in aquaculture technology, you might look into going to Florida Atlantic University because they have a really good program in that. Okay, so I've alluded to this uh, irony of aquaculture aquaculture a little bit in some of the earlier slides, um, but it's really, really important to emphasize on its own slide here, the central irony of mariculture. So mariculture species, so fish, marine fish that are farmed, are usually fed the products of capture fisheries. So the whole idea of, oh yeah, we're going to have fish farming so we don't need to capture fish from the wild is destroyed by this irony because you have to catch a large amount of fish from the wild to be the fish food for the fish that you're farming. And because of trophic inefficiency, you're getting like a, a less than 10% um, transfer efficiency from the fish food to the fish that you're farming. So you're having to put in like a hundred tons of fish food to get 10 tons of fish product. In fact, I believe for bluefin tuna, the efficiency rate is even less. And it's something like a hundred tons of food needed to create three tons of tuna. So um, the gr expansion of mariculture leads to actually increasing pressure on um, the uh, capture fishery, so we're going out and killing more bait fish than ever uh, just so that we can feed the fish in our fish farms and that it could be really economically harmful particularly to other species in the environment that depend on those bait fish for food things like seabirds for example. Um, the reason that we need to catch fish from the wild to feed to our mariculture species is um, because there are some nutritional components in fish meal and fish oil, particularly omega-3 highly unsaturated fatty acids that are really, really important for the life cycle and growth and development of marine fishes. And so it's hard to raise the fish, uh, if not impossible, without feeding them these uh, fish that we catch from the wild. So um, the, the key reason that fish that are being predatory fish that are being grown in aquaculture settings need to be fed other fish sources is because of this particular type of fatty acids in uh, fish called HUFAs, highly unsaturated fatty acids. Uh, they're also known as omega-3 fatty acids because um, three carbons from the end of the fatty acid chain, there is a double bond in the, um, uh, uh, in the chain here. And 
that is what we call being unsaturated when there's a double bond. So it's an unsaturation at the third carbon from the tail, and that's um, where we get omega-3 um, unsaturated fatty acids. So um, we've been trying to figure out some ways to get around this big limitation uh, in the nutritional requirements of marine fish, trying to mix their diets, feeding them some food that's from more sustainable sources like terrestrial agriculture waste, and then putting in just enough fish oil or fish waste to give them the uh, amount of hoofas that they need. Uh, we've also been trying to do genetic engineering like uh, genetically engineering algae that will have these types of fatty acids in them and then we'd be able to feed the fish the algae instead of having to catch more fish to feed the fish. Uh, and we try to do as much recycling as possible like the heads and guts and fins of the fish that we harvest, we grind those up and feed that waste back to the fish um, and they can get some of the uh, chemicals that they need that way. Uh, there are some risks in doing that though that you might spread diseases or contamination back to the back to the fish. Okay so um, I mentioned earlier that there's these sort of different degrees of aquaculture. There's intensive and extensive. Intensive is when you put a lot of work into raising those organisms from babies to adulthood and sort of you manage every little step of the way, whereas extensive is where you let nature do more of the work. And this picture here shows kind of like an extreme of intensive cultivation where the fish are being kept in actually an indoor warehouse. Uh, they're kept at really high densities, so you can see how thick the fish are in the water here. Uh, so to do this kind of intensive cultivation, uh, you need species that are tolerant of crowding and low dissolved oxygen levels. And you need to deal with the parasite and disease transmission, which will be really high when you have such a crowded situation. So you need either fish that are naturally or bred to be resistant to parasites and diseases, or you need to feed them lots of drugs and put um, drugs in the water to kill the parasites and diseases. And you can feed the fish vitamins and antibiotics to reduce the effects of stress. But that means that the water is all polluted with all kinds of the stuff that you're putting in there, like the antibiotics and the um, uh, things that kill the parasites. And you're sort of breeding all of these drug-resistant germs. You're getting really high levels of nutrients that are building up in the water. And then when the polluted water is released from the fish farm back into the environment, you're spreading all of this pollution into the environment. Uh, and that pollution includes biological pollution like uh, antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria, which can even cause hard-to-treat infections in humans, uh, particularly worrisome if they're bacteria like Vibrio, um, uh, f also known as the flesh-eating bacteria. So um, we need to be careful about our intensive cultivation. Uh, okay, so one of the ways to do aquaculture that can sometimes be more sustainable than just growing one species uh, in one place is polyculture, where you're growing multiple species in the same setting. So the, there was that carp example that I gave where there's five different species of carp that eat different things, and you can grow them together and sort of achieve a greater overall production by the fact that they're feeding on complementary things. Uh, but there are lots of other clever ways that humans are exploring to sort of combine different species in aquaculture. Uh, some of them even combine terrestrial species with aquatic species. So you take the wastes from your terrestrial farming, like your pig feed and pig poop, and have that waste go and feed the uh, omnivorous fish, like the catfish that you're rearing. And it sort of uh, takes care of the waste problem and creates an additional food source as well, as long as you don't mind eating fish that ate pig poop their whole lives. Another uh, interesting way that we're combining aquaculture is by taking the wastewater from um, fish pens and using the nutrient-rich wastewater to grow vegetables hydroponically. And that has the benefit of cleaning the excess nutrients out of the wastewater so that it won't cause algae blooms when it's released into the environment. Uh, 
and also it grows vegetables. Um, and there's an example that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail in some upcoming slides uh, with putting urchins and wrasse into pens where we're growing salmon. So having these secondary species grown in with the salmon can help the salmon in ways that I'll talk about coming up. Salmon aquaculture is one of the most popular kinds of aquaculture in the world, but it, there's actually really, there's two very different types of salmon aquaculture. And one of them is used predominantly with the Pacific salmon, which are five or six species of salmon in the genus Oncorhynchus. And this one here is um, a Chinook salmon. I forget what the species name is, but it's in the genus Oncorhynchus. And um, the, the type of aquaculture that's used for Pacific salmon is extensive aquaculture, where we actually let the fish live their adult life in the wild, but we uh, sort of run them into hatcheries when they come back to the rivers to spawn and we sort of raise the eggs and babies and young stage in the hatchery before releasing them back into the wild which means we get higher recruitment and a bigger return on the stock so that's uh, a type of extensive aquaculture which is the type of aquaculture used for Pacific salmon in the genus Uncorhynchus. Uh, the more um, common type of salmon aquaculture and if you buy salmon at a restaurant anywhere in the world except the west coast of the United States usually you will be getting Atlantic salmon uh, which is grown in an intensive aquaculture manner so that means that the salmon even when they're adults they're grown in these confined pens uh, rather than ever being released into the environment so one of the challenges of salmon aquaculture of the Atlantic salmon is the types of pollution that happen when you have a bunch of these salmon crowded into a pen in the water. So you have to feed these salmon a whole bunch and they'll eat a lot of the food but they won't eat all of it so there's some waste food that goes down to the bottom and rots. And there's also the food that does get eaten ends up turning into feces and that goes down to the bottom and rots as well. So you've got this really gunky impacted area on the bottom underneath the fish pen. In addition to the uh, solid bits of waste that settle to the bottom, there is dissolved wastes like ammonia and phosphate uh, from the fish's liquid wastes that can cause algae blooms in the water. Um, via increased nutrient levels and so that's what it says here increased potential for algae blooms um, so when you have all this waste falling down to the bottom it can sort of smother the sea bottom life and the algae blooms in the water can also have negative effects on, on sea life you can uh, use this model of sediment organic enrichment to kind of picture what's happening under a salmon pen before the pen is built, the sea bottom has a modest amount of organic matter being delivered and has a biodiverse community. But as the amount of organic enrichment in the sediment is increasing more and more, uh, you get um, a sort of a shoaling of the oxycline and there's less and less biodiversity in the sediment and you end up having this anoxic low biodiversity environment underneath the salmon pen where there's very little invertebrate life and it's just microbes. So there are some ways that people who are growing salmon in pens in the wild are trying to use uh, what they call integrated multi-trophic aquaculture which is uh, just a type of polyculture really to try to mitigate some of the impacts of the salmon. So one of the impacts of the salmon uh, and feeding them in their poop is that there's all these particles uh, released into the water that are uh, can accumulate on the bottom and then cause the problems on the bottom that we we're talking about in the last slide but if you have rafts of bivalves like mussels or oysters arranged around the salmon pen in the areas where the currents are sweeping the particles um, they will eat up some of those particles and reduce the amount um, that's settling to the bottom and, and messing up the bottom for the liquid wastes coming out of the salmon pen, if you have seaweed aquaculture, seaweed growing on strings around the salmon pens, 
then the seaweed will absorb those dissolved chemicals like nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water and reduce the nutrient concentration in the water, which reduces the chance to have more harmful algae blooms. So uh, those are two uh, types of aquaculture that can be coupled with the salmon aquaculture to uh, get an added benefit of more products, but also reduce the impacts on the environment. And that's not all. There's even more polyculture that we can do with the salmon. So another problem that we have when we have these pens in the ocean environment is that the mesh of the pens gets covered over with algae and um, fouling communities of sessile invertebrates that reduces water circulation into the pens and can cause problems with low dissolved oxygen. So if you've got some kind of invertebrate grazers like sea urchins in the pens, this is supposed to be a sea urchin, it's a spiky ball here. They can actually eat the algae growing on the pens and uh, keep the pens clean. And then you can go in and harvest the sea urchins later and extract a food product from them known as uni in Japanese cuisine. Um, so there's a problem with growing fish in pens in the wild, and that's that they're being crowded together creates a perfect breeding environment for fish lice, these ectoparasites, external um, parasites on the organisms, these crustaceans that cling to them and, and suck their blood and tissue. And um, so wild fish that get too near the pens can actually be exposed to the fish lice. It's sort of like if, you know, if there's a slaughterhouse where cows are being killed, there's probably tons and tons of flies buzzing around the slaughterhouse. And if uh, a wild animal wandered near the slaughterhouse, it might get bitten by flies. That's kind of the same analogy. That, that's an analogy as to what's happening with the fish lice and the fish farms. When wild fish get too near the fish farm, they can run into this cloud of parasites that have been breeding in the fish farm. and the wild fish can't handle the stresses of the wild, plus having tons of parasites on them. Uh, so in the fish farm, they usually treat for the parasites with pesticides, chemicals that kill crustaceans. The thing is that those pesticides will kill other crustaceans in the area as well. And interestingly, in some places, there have been big conflicts between shrimp and crab fishermen and the salmon farmers because the pesticides used in the salmon farms will kill the shrimp and crabs in addition to killing the fish lice. So a non-toxic way to potentially deal with the fish lice is to have this type of wrasse, a cold water, large cold water wrasse called the Balan wrasse. Uh, I think it's native to Europe and the Mediterranean. Um, if we have that wrasse growing in the salmon pens, then it may be able to eat the lice off of the salmon and um, reduce the lice problem without having to treat them with chemicals that might hurt other crustaceans in the environment. All right, so there is a really common theme in a lot of aquaculture and farming in general, and that's genetic modification. So you may have heard of like GMO foods, which are crops that have been genetically modified. Um, and genetic modification is a thing in aquaculture as well. So some genetic modification is nothing new. It's just the typical selective breeding techniques that have been used in farming ever since agriculture was invented 10,000 years ago um, at the end of the last ice age by uh, early homo sapiens. Um, and so that's selective breeding. You basically take the animals with the characteristics that you like best, you have them breed, and then the next generation is more suited to whatever you need. And for aquaculture, our needs are, you know, we want fish that put all their energy into growing big and fat, and they don't need to swim around long distances or anything. So we want bigger bodies, smaller fins, smaller heads, and we want them to grow fast be tolerant of stresses like low dissolved oxygen and uh, parasite loads and things like that. Um, so we can achieve some of that through selective breeding, but uh, now in the 21st century we have other techniques available as well, including biotechnology. So we can get really fancy with our selective breeding by cryopreserving the gametes, the eggs and sperm of the best fishes and using them to start the, the next generation. We can uh, 
have the fertilization occur in laboratory conditions that will create triploid offspring that have uh, three copies of each chromosome. And we do that sometimes for two reasons. One is because the triploid organisms tend to grow faster than the normal diploid organisms because they're unable to breed and they put all their energy into somatic growth, growth of their bodies, instead of um, sexual development. So that's one reason to make triploid organisms. And the other reason is if we want to be raising those organisms in a place where they're not native, we don't want them to escape and breed in the environment. And triploid organisms are usually not able to breed. So you, if you have a bunch of baby triploid organisms, they're going to get big but they're not going to be able to reproduce and get loose in the wild. So um, triploid uh, techniques to make triploid organisms are used in various kinds of aquaculture. And then the fanciest type of biotech that we use for aquaculture is uh, what people call genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology where you take DNA code from various organisms and combine it together and give organisms genes and abilities and traits that they never had before. Uh, and that can be really powerful, but it could also lead to some problems. So I'll talk about one of the examples and some of the concerns about genetically modified seafood on the next page. This Aku Advantage salmon is actually a patented type of fish. So uh, the Aqua Advantage salmon are genetically modified Atlantic salmon that have been modified with a growth hormone gene from the Chinook salmon, a salmon in a different genus that uh, grows very large, and um, also modified with a gene from the ocean pout uh, type of cold water deep sea fish that has an antifreeze protein gene and promoter. And the combination of these two genes means that the modified salmon grow large and fast even in cold water, which is something that the wild Atlantic salmon didn't do. So wild Atlantic salmon in cold water, they didn't grow very fast. But with this uh, growth hormone gene and the antifreeze protein and promoter uh, installed in the salmon, they grow to marketable size in like two years and that's much faster or maybe it's even one year anyways they, they grow so much faster that you can bring them to market uh, much quicker and that means that it's like a whole year less of having to feed and take care of the salmon before you can sell them which is very very appealing to the salmon farmers although there are people who don't like to eat genetically modified food and uh, so it, it could be harder to find a market for these salmon and there are some countries due to environmental or ethical concerns that ban genetically modified food and they wouldn't be able to have these salmon in those countries. All right, so we've mentioned a lot of environmental risks of marine aquaculture and this slide here is nice because it summarizes a lot of the risks. So the first and most important uh, environmental problem of marine aquaculture is the fact that you have to feed most of these fish the products of wild caught fisheries. So you have to go out and catch tons of fish from the wild just to feed the fish that you're rearing and you're actually putting in more weight of fish than you're getting out due to the inherent trophic inefficiency of the food chain. You know, so you're putting in 10 tons of fish, you're only getting one ton out. Um, uh, another problem is the introduction of non-native species. So a lot of times we want to raise a fish that's marketable even if it's not native to the area. And so uh, some places in the Pacific, they'll actually raise Atlantic salmon in aquaculture and then it's a problem if they get out uh, because they could get into the wild and compete with the native species. Uh, the same thing happens uh, very often with shellfish aquaculture, like the types of oysters that we raise in different parts of the world are more often than not, it seems, not even native to that part of the world. There's The other thing that is a problem is all of the drugs and pesticides that we have to put into the fish farms to keep those crowded fish alive. Uh, 
uh, herbicides to control algae growth on the pens, which can also kill native plants and seaweeds. Um, there's the genetically modified organism issues uh, that we talked about, which could you know, potentially get loose or compete with or uh, contaminate the wild stocks. Um, there's the introduction of diseases and parasites, which breed in the crowded pens and then get out into the environment and cause trouble. And then there's all of this organic waste plopping out of the fish pens that contaminates the bottom and creates this pollution problem on the bottom. All right, so uh, most of those problems that we were talking about were particular problems with intensive agriculture where you've got a high concentration of fish that you're feeding. And so some of those problems can be avoided if we're doing extensive aquaculture or, or stock enhancement. And so salmon hatcheries like they use for the Pacific salmon in the genus Oncorhynchus um, are that type of aquaculture. So to enhance the stock, usually, it, well, it's, it's not cheap. It, it takes a lot of money to um, spawn a bunch of baby salmon or other fish and then rear them up to a fingerling size or so before you can release them into the environment. And also when you release them into the environment, uh, you can lose a lot of the stock because once they're out loose in the environment, they're exposed to predators and diseases and the hazards of nature. So you're putting a lot of money into raising a bunch of babies and then you're flooding them into the environment where they're going to be taken out by uh, natural factors and you'll get a relatively small return on that in some cases. Uh, also, you know, who's paying for the stock enhancement. It's, it's generally something that's uh, paid for by the government as a way to kind of subsidize or, or help out the fishing industry. And it's questionable whether that's really uh, economically a good investment or if it's sort of a waste of taxpayer money. So it's definitely something that needs to be considered carefully whenever um, stock enhancement is proposed. Um, uh, another one of the issues is how do you know which fish in the wild are the ones that you raised in captivity? Uh, one of the ways that you can do that is with tags. And there's also some genetic t techniques that can help with that. I'll talk about tags on the next slide. Uh, well, I'll, so, so there are some concerns about uh, stock enhancement and uh, one the main concern is whether it's worth it. Does it actually enhance the total stock or population that you're trying to enhance? And so if the stock goes up when you start your fish hatchery, that might mean that your fish hatchery is working or it might just mean that the stock was naturally going to go up anyways and you would need to check and make sure that the fish that you're finding as adults in the wild are actually the fish that you reared in your hatchery. So you need a way to keep track of the hatchery versus the wild um, raised species or individuals. Uh, so one way that that's done with salmon is all the baby salmon before they release them they clip uh, the fatty second dorsal fin known as the adipose fin they clip that off and so that stays off it doesn't grow back even when the salmon gets big so if you find an adult salmon that has no adipose fin you know that it came from a hatchery and sometimes there's actually different rules on whether you can keep fish or not depending on if they came from a hatchery or not so if you're trying to protect the wild caught fish then sometimes you're allowed to keep the hatchery fish but you're not allowed to keep the ones that bred in the wild um, because they'll go back to their wild streams and potentially perpetuate the uh, wild population. All right, so one of the concerns with stock enhancement is what if you are successful and you are pumping a lot of hatchery bred fish out into the environment? Will that interfere with the wild portion of the stock? So those fishes are obviously going to be competing for the same resources, like the same uh, bait fish for food. Um, and if the fish from the hatcheries breed together with the wild fish, that could genetically dilute the diversity of the wild stocks, since fish that are bred in captivity, uh, usually since there's many, many fish from just a few parents, they don't have the genetic diversity as the that the wild stocks do and that loss of genetic diversity could mean that those fish are less capable of dealing with the changes in nature and less capable of surviving in the wild 
than the naturally wild fish are. Also, if you get too dependent on stock enhancement, then there's less of an incentive to really protect the wild fishes. And to protect the wild fishes, you often have to protect wild habitats as well. Like for salmon, since they breed in streams in forests of the Pacific Northwest and they need cold water, you have to protect the forest so the streams are shady and cool. And so the salmon fishermen who depend on wild salmon are really good advocates for protecting the forests because they know that you need those shady, cool streams for the salmon to breed in. And if we weren't dependent on wild salmon anymore, then maybe we wouldn't be protecting our forests as well either. And so there are a lot of examples like that uh, where it's good in a way that we're dependent on the wild harvest because that encourages us to protect the total wild ecosystem. And if we're dependent on artificially reared fish, we might not be as caring about the wild ecosystem that's producing the fish. So there is a type of aquaculture that seems to be in some ways the perfect type of aquaculture because it doesn't require food, uh, at least not in much of the life stages. And that was one of the biggest problems with uh, fish aquaculture is, you know, you have to feed them the products of wild caught fisheries, which is very expensive and wasteful and, um, you know, you end up having to catch many more fish than you're actually getting back from the aquaculture. But bivalves like clams, oysters, and mussels, they feed on plankton, which in some cases due to nutrient pollution, there's actually an excess of plankton in the coastal waters. And so having this type of aquaculture actually gets rid of that excess plankton and that's a beneficial thing for the environment. So it seems then that bivalve aquaculture would be the perfect aquaculture. Um, it's no, nothing is really perfect though. One of the things that's tough about bivalve aquaculture is they have these microscopic planktonic larvae and it can be tricky to get the parent bivalves to breed when they're in captivity and then you need to rear and feed them plankton well and and keep the planktonic larvae of the bivalves uh, growing in tanks until they're old enough to settle to the bottom and be these little bitty uh, clams, oysters, or mussels that you can then put out into the environment. So you need this whole kind of elaborate plankton growing, plankton breeding area in order to do bivalve aquaculture um, just to produce the the seed oysters, as they call them, the little baby ones that are big enough to put out into the environment. Um, you also need to provide some substrate for them. So depending on the type of bivalve, that, that changes what type of substrate it would be. For mussels, a lot of times they let the baby ones attach to strings and then they hang the strings in the water. For oysters, they often grow in bags. And for um, clams, they would be growing up in the mud or sand, but you need to have some net over them to keep the predators out. Uh, so providing a substrate for them and protecting them from the predators, competitors, parasites, and diseases is a concern. Uh, this is uh, organism as a sand shrimp, and they tend to destabilize the mud underneath uh, oyster farms and cause the oyster bags to sink into the mud and all the oysters to die. And so they're a real pest in oyster farms, even though they're just doing their natural thing and they are a native species. Uh, but sometimes the oyster farmers will kill them with uh, crustacean killing poison just so that they'll stop stirring up the mud and causing the mud to turn into quicksand that the oyster bags sink into. Okay, so um, even though the bivalve aquaculture is doing this beneficial thing of filtering the water, it takes up a lot of space and can cut down on the habitat for wild organisms. This is an aerial photo of a bunch of clam beds, and you can see that they take up a huge section of the bottom in this estuary. And when you have a high concentration of bivalves in an area, even though you're not putting food into that area, they are taking all the plankton that drifts by and turning it into bivalve poop which then enriches the sediment in organic matter. And if there's too much of it, uh, 
can cause the same kinds of organic enrichment symptoms that you would have like underneath a salmon farm where all the salmon poop and, and uneaten food is piling up. So organic enrichment of the benthos is something that can happen even um, for bivalves uh, where you're not feeding them any extra food just because they're uh, doing so much benthic pelagic coupling, taking the food out of the pelagic environment and putting wastes, uh, organic rich wastes down in the sediment. Uh, other types of bivalve aquaculture have other impacts. Mussels that are grown hanging from rafts, like in Puget Sound here near where I grew up, shade the bottom. So if there were going to be seagrasses or seaweeds growing on the bottom, they can no longer grow where they're under the shade of one of these mussel rafts. Another impact to the environment, physical impact to the environment from bivalve aquaculture is like this one that you see here in France where there's uh, elaborate structures of cages and, and racks and nets where the oysters are being grown. And when we go out and harvest those with these vehicles at low tide, that really disturbs and disrupts the bottom. And so you wouldn't have as, as great a richness of other benthic organisms in this intertidal area where this is happening. Um, and some of the concerns that we have with fish aquaculture are concerns with bivalve aquaculture as well. So if you're breeding a lot of bivalves in captivity and then putting them out in the environment, when they release their eggs and sperm in the environment, those genes are going out into um, the natural population and potentially diluting it or uh, weakening it with genes that may be they're less diverse or less adapted to surviving in the wild because they came from these domestically bred bivalves. And also, we can introduce invasive species this way. Sometimes that's actually been done on purpose. Uh, like with the introduction of some Atlantic and Pacific species into the Mediterranean for oysters, and other times uh, it's been done accidentally. So an interesting story about bivalve aquaculture and so how it's gone wrong in some ways um, is found in Chesapeake Bay, which is on the east coast of North America. So there are oysters that live on, you know, co in coastal areas all over the world and many different species that have been transferred to and fro and across uh, oceans. And so it's really funny that, you know, many of the places, the oysters that they have there now are from some completely different part of the world. And Chesapeake Bay has had a little bit of that as well. Okay, so, so Chesapeake Bay oysters, um, the species that's native to Chesapeake Bay is Chrysostria virginica, the so-called eastern oyster or the Virginia oyster. And uh, originally they were not grown by aquaculture. They were harvested from the wild. So this was a capture fishery uh, initially. And in fact, one of the problems is that it stayed a capture fishery too long. We actually probably should have tried to switch to aquaculture earlier. Uh, anyways, you can see in this graph here that there were massive harvests of oysters in the 19th century. Um, tons and tons of oysters were caught in Maryland and Virginia, the states bordering Chesapeake Bay. And that number just really declined and was quite low even by the 1930s. Uh, and then it kind of hovered around from the 1930s to the 60s uh, and then took another plunge um, and was pretty low in the 80s and then through the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s just went down, 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 down. And so um, this is due to a combination of over harvesting and diseases. Um, so one of the things that really adds insult to in injury is that the, there was little recognition of the fact that the substrate, the shells that were already on the bottom were really, really important for new oysters to settle onto and, and recruit to. And so they would take the living oysters off the reefs but then th to eat, but then they would also mine the reefs to use the shell for mortar and lime for building towns and roads and things like that. So um, we kind of destroyed the reef substrate uh, 
that the oysters were growing on in addition to taking the oyster the living oysters off those reefs and that sort of reduced the avail ab ability of the oysters to, to come back um, so once we realized that we were in this big problem due to over harvesting the oysters we didn't take the important action which would be to reduce the harvesting rate of oysters instead we tried to introduce non-native oysters thinking that maybe they would uh, grow and um, add to the productivity of, of the Chesapeake Bay in terms of oysters and we'd still be able to harvest all that we wanted um, but the non-native oysters were not able to survive in Chesapeake Bay unfortunately the diseases that we brought in with those non-native oysters did survive and that caused the uh, growth rate of oysters to decline so that's this sort of drop that you see here with these two diseases dermo and MSX which were introduced um, in the mid 20th century and so uh, we're in this really bad situation today due to a combination of disease and over harvesting and why we're still harvesting oysters from the wild in Chesapeake Bay I don't know but for some reason maybe it's just tradition uh, most people sort of favor stock enhancement over aquaculture so they really really want to harvest oysters from the wild and so um, when oysters are raised in a hatchery as extensive aquaculture they're sort of put into the wild and then the oyster harvesters go and take them and they're never allowed to like build up and create a reef again so uh, I think what really really need to do is focus on what's called ecological restoration which is sort of rebuilding the oyster reefs and not harvesting them uh, in order to get the oyster population back into Chesapeake Bay and then as for oysters that we want to eat we should switch to aquaculture methods for them rather than sort of scraping the oysters off of these precious slow growing oyster reefs that are good for the environment. All right, another sort of example of aquaculture gone bad that I'd like to share is the shrimp farming vignette. So, this is a shrimp farm in um, actually, with this picture, I'm not sure if this is from uh, Southeast Asia or from. Central America but the problem is very similar in both places you've got these areas that are low-lying coastal areas where there's mangrove habitat and the mangrove habitat is being displaced in order to grow shrimp in farms and the shrimp sell for a lot of money it's really a lucrative business but the only problem is that it destroys the mangroves and mangroves provide a lot of natural benefits such as protecting the coastline as removing pollution from the water enhancing wild fisheries because young fish live and grow in mangroves and so uh, even though you're getting some benefit from farming the shrimp you're losing all of those benefits of the mangroves and economists who've analyzed it have found that it's actually uh, you're worse off when you destroy the mangroves to make a mangrove farm or so to make a shrimp farm than if you just continue to receive the economic benefits from the intact mangroves. Um, so one of the reasons that the shrimp farming is a disaster in the long term is that water quality declines pretty quickly in these pits where they grow, where they chop the mangroves down and then and then grow shrimp because all of the waste from the uneaten food and the shrimp food piles up at the bottom and then the ponds eventually become so gross and mucky that you can't then nothing can survive in them anymore and what's usually happens then is more mangroves are cut down to build more ponds um, because it's pretty expensive to demuck the pond and then you have to figure out something to do with all the old dead shrimp poop um, so this cycle is happening in multiple parts of the world particularly in poor countries where there's not a lot of regulation and people don't have that many other ways to make money and uh, it's, it's really accelerating and a lot of mangroves around the world are being killed. So one potential thing that we could start doing to reduce this impact would be to leave more of the mangroves intact um, and do what we call polyculture with mangroves. Um, let me just mention a couple of other things about this uh, shrimp farming thing. Um, the, there was an economic analysis done that I alluded to that sort of compared the values that mangroves themselves provide to the values that you get from a shrimp farm and found that you know the optimal amount of uh, mangroves to cut down and turn into shrimp farms was like hardly any <laughs> that 
leaving the bulk of the mangrove forests intact was really the uh, gave you the most net economic benefit um, and yet you know that hasn't quite stopped people from cutting down the mangroves yet uh, so uh, as I was saying there's a couple of things that we can do to where we have cut the mangroves down uh, there's a couple of things that we could do to reduce the impacts of shrimp farming one thing is crop rotation so instead of just trying to grow shrimp 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 uh, we could grow shrimp for a while and then grow some bivalves or some uh, seaweeds that would remove materials from the water and wouldn't need to be fed additional food and that can uh, uh, keep the ponds sustainable longer so you don't have to cut down more mangroves and build new ponds another thing we could do is polyculture with mangroves so mangroves themselves can be a crop because they are wood and wood is used for fuel and building materials and so in some parts of the world they're growing mangroves and farming the shrimp in the waters surrounding the mangroves the mangroves can also remove some of the excess nutrients from the system and help oxygenate the sediment and things like that so polyculture with mangroves can sort of help with the shrimp farming and also the overall environmental health and um, I hope that with all these thoughts in your minds you'll go forward thinking about ways that we could apply our marine ecology knowledge to get resources that we need from the marine environment and yet not take such a heavy toll on the marine environment and to sort of combine um, different types of uh, agriculture with ecosystem and habitat restoration and have some win-win kind of situations where we're providing habitats or ecosystem services in the course of growing harvestable products from the ocean. Thanks.